Um, it's about five o'clock, and we have an extraordinary uh, panel lined up for you. And so, I, 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 by the way, I'm Joe Trotter, okay? Johnny, <laughs> professor and director of CAR. Um, we want to make our introduction short tonight because we have two writers of major books, and then a chair who is also uh, an accomplished scholar. And so we want to give them enough time to say what they have to say and for you to have input. Uh, so I'm especially happy about tonight. But I do want to thank our sponsors, uh, the dean of the college, president, uh, the provost, all levels of the university that support our effort, and especially our chair, Donna Harsh, who is in the room somewhere. So people, please, I want you to know our chair. Okay. <laughs> um, but also, I want to um, point out Nico Slate. You know, we have an advisory board that helped uh, us to organize our activities, Nico. Also, I want to point out, um, especially, Hikari Ede, who is the coordinator of program uh, for helping to organize these events. But tonight is my distinct pleasure to introduce Kevin Mumford, who will in turn introduce the panelists. Uh, Kevin Mumford is a professor of history at the University of Illinois. He received his MA and PhD degrees from Stanford University. Um, and he's going to chair this panel, but when we organized this panel, it was in part a product of a graduate seminar. And graduate students who are here, please hold your hand up, whether you were in the seminar or not. Wow. Because in that seminar, we read uh, the two books that you are going to hear about uh, today. And it was suggested that maybe we should bring both of them to the university and have a conversation. So our speaker, Kevin Mumford, when we decided to bring these two scholars to town, he came to mind immediately as a moderator. Uh, Professor Mumford is not only a prolific specialist in African American urban social and political history, he is also a pioneer of an, in, of an emerging new field of research at the intersection of African American sexuality and gender studies and history. He has produced several groundbreaking books. The most recent one published in 2016 titled Not Straight, Not White, Black Gay Men from the March on Washington to the AIDS Crisis, published by the University of North Carolina Press. Another of his stellar books is Newark, A History of Race, Rights, and Riots in America, published by New York University Press. And his earlier book called Interzone, which played a major role in sort of helping us to begin thinking about gender, sexuality, class, race, and so on in an urban context. Interzone, black, white, sex districts in Chicago and New York in the early 20th century. And so we're delighted to have him moderate this panel. But he is the recipient of several awards, prestigious honors. Uh, one of them is the Brinkley Stevenson Award, given by the Organization of American Historians for the best article in the Journal of American History in 2011. Another is the Audrey Lord Prize. And this uh, prize was given for an outstanding article on LGBT history in the past two years of the journal, uh, published, um, given in 2012. He's also been a senior Fulbright scholar and a fellow at the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History. And I could go on, but we want him to come forward and put us in touch with the two speakers. So let us welcome Kevin Mumford. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Um, as Joe indicated, let, I, I'm going to try to make this brief so that we can get to the to the heart of the of our business here today. 
Our first speaker is Talitha LaFloria. She is the Lisa Smith Discovery Associate Professor in African, and African American Studies at the University of Virginia. She's a scholar of African American history specializing in mass incarceration, modern slavery, race and medicine, and black women in America. She's the author of Chained in Silence, you see over here, uh, Black Women in Convict Labor in the New South, which is uh, also published by U University of North Carolina Press in 2015. Mm -hmm. Now, hold on for this list. This book received several awards, including the Darlene Clark Hine Award from the Organization of American Historians, the Philip Taft Labor History Award from, uh, from the Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations and Labor and Working Class History Association, the Malcolm Bell Jr. And Muriel Barrow Bell Award from the Georgia Historical Society, the Best First Book Prize from the Berkshire Conference on Women, on the History of Women, Genders, and Sexualities, and finally the Letitia Woods Brown Memorial Prize from the Association of Black Women Historians. Her work has been featured in the Sundance nominated documentary Slavery by Another Name, as well as C SPAN. Her written work and expertise has been profiled in Ms. Magazine, The Nation, Huffington Post. For Harriet, the new Tri-State Defender, and Colorblind Magazine. Uh, Professor LaFloria also serves on the board of directors for the Historians Against Slavery, the Association of Black Women Historians, and the Georgia Historical Quarterly. So, what do you want to do? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your generous introduction. Um, I'd like to thank Professor Trotter and the organizers of this event for inviting me to be here today to discuss um, the making of my recently published book, Change in Silence, Black Women and Convict Labor in the New South. I'd also like to thank my co-panelist, Professor Sarah Haley, for making Incarcerated Black Women's Lives Matter and for contributing to a canon that until now has excluded black women's experiences. So I salute you. Black women and girls, for that matter, are and always have been over-policed, over-incarcerated, and under-protected. They are just as hyper-visible to police today as they were during the post-Civil War period, and they are equally vulnerable to state-sanctioned violence and mass incarceration. Sadly, the culture of silence that exists around these issues is no less pervasive and perpetual now than it was in the past. The overemphasis on the plight of the black male in the US injustice system and their experiences of state violence has resulted in the obscuring of black women's experiences of mass imprisonment and violence. Their cries have been and are still being drowned out amid the deafening defense of black manhood. I was inspired to write Chain in Silence because I wanted to make incarcerated black women visible and legible, to document the inner li their inner lives and to tell their stories. I also wanted to dismantle widely held assumptions about imprisoned black women's reduced worth and profitability when compared with black men. Chain in Silence was written as a corrective to the male-centric, uneven rendering of the history of convict leasing and the chain gang system. Mm -hmm. It was my way of moving working class, incarcerated black women and girls' lives, labors, travails, and fleeting triumphs from the periphery to the center of historical discourse, accounting for the role they played in rebuilding the physical and economic infrastructure of the New South. Reaching to the outermost margins of history to salvage the voices of the forgotten, this was my way of reclaiming lesser known, less respectable black women whose burdens and tribulations had been left unaccounted for. In order to tell these stories, I had to dig deep. I mined eight archives, hundreds of 19th century newspaper articles, manuscripts, clemency applications, misdemeanor chain gang monthly reports, prison camp hospital registers, annual and biennial reports of the prison commission, whipping reports, census records, court transcripts, prison physicians reports, and a range of other sources to reconstruct this history. And each record revealed something different about the day-to-day -day realities that women face. 
Clemency applications, for example, gave me a glimpse into the medical struggles incarcerated women experienced. I discovered that many inmates were sick and dying at the point of clemency, and that they were only released because they were no longer viable. Through these records, I also witnessed the desperation on the part of prisoners, family members, and sympathetic petitioners who wrote in on these women's behalf advocating for their release. One of the most impactful and illuminating examples of the state's handling of seemingly disposable black female bodies can be found in the case of Ella Gamble. In 1884, Gamble, a 22-year-old pregnant newlywed mother and domestic worker, was convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment in the Georgia State Penitentiary. From the point of her incarceration until the date of her release, she passed through five prison camps, a broom factory, two brickyards, and two plantations. Her final destination was the state prison farm, where she spent the last months of her life dying from cancer and begging to be free. These were some of her last words. Judge Turner, kind sir, I write you and humbly beg you to please send me home. I've been down sick in bed 12 months today, judge. I don't feel like I will be here on earth very long. I don't want to die here in prison, and I beg you to please judge for the sake of my poor father who is, lying in his, who is lying in his grave and my mother and brother and sister who is watching and waiting on me, on, waiting on you to send me home so I can see their faces. Judge, I am no service to myself and neither to the state. Judge, please have mercy on me and grant me one kind favor in sending me home, for I have cancer in my bowels. Some weeks I bleed very near to death. Judge, please pity me and let me go home. To some extent, Gamble's poor health resulted from heavy labor she was forced to perform while in prison. But much of the damage caused to her organs stemmed from merciless floggings, sexual abuse, and medical neglect, in addition to injurious childbirths. Census records show that by 1900, Gamble had given birth to six babies, four living and two dead. At least one of these children was conceived with her husband between 1880, the year they were married, and 1884, the year she was convicted. The rest of her offspring, uh, produced over the 16-year period where she was separated from her husband, well, the 20-year period while she was incarcerated, rather, the rest of her offspring were likely the byproduct of rape in the state's camps. Incidences of sexual violence and what I call menacing reproduction littered the Southern Prison Archive. But babies' footprints left no impressions in the annals of Georgia's penitentiary system. Although pregnancies and childbirths were meticulously registered by prison camp doctors, the status of these offspring was omitted from these otherwise copious records. Children born to incarcerated mothers had no value, and black women's wombs after slavery had no worth. Whereas the viability of the southern plantation economy rested on enslaved women's capacity to produce labor and laborers, post-Civil War penal regimes viewed pregnancy and childbirth as deterrents to economic progress. This is best illustrated through the act of killing infants born in prison camps and the prioritization of heavy manual labor, which resulted in the wounding and permanent impairment of imprisoned black women's reproductive bodies. The story of Eliza Randall, a 17-year-old, quote, Negro girl who was convicted of murdering her abusive father, who, in her words, forced her into, quote, improper relations with him and threatened to whip her, stands out as an intense illustration of the effects of menacing reproduction mm -hmm. on the lives of incarcerated black women and girls in the post-Civil War South. Mm -hmm. On January 5th, 1892, Randall gave birth um, at the Camp Herdmont Prison Plantation, which you see pictured here. This is a sketch um, of Camp Herdmont. Mm -hmm. It was, she, her baby was also the first to die. Soon after taking his first breath, Randall's baby was carried to a river and plunged into a liquid grave. On the word of Bud Hilly, a former guard at the camp, quote, on more than one occasion, a convict would give birth. No time could be spared for a nursing mother. So on Maddox's standing order, the newborn was simply taken to the river and thrown in, end quote. With her heart dragging from the heaviness of her grief, Randall was immediately forced back to work. She was put in charge of running a sawmill and cotton gin and performing half of the blacksmithing for Camp Herdmont. 
In my attempts to locate more examples of the vicious treatment of black mothers and children born in the state's camps, I turned to publish essays written by prison reformers and newspaper articles. This is how I was introduced to Carrie Massey, um, and I want to actually read a couple of passages from the book that document Massey's journey through uh, Georgia's convict lease system. At the rising Fawn prison mine, tucked away in the foothills of Dade County, mm -hmm. Carrie Massey, a 16-year-old Negro girl, built her home in the depths of despair. The young woman's ordeal began in 1882, when she was convicted of murdering William Evans, a well-known owner of a general store in the town of Summerfield near Macon, Georgia. On the night of the killing, Bill Carstarfin, a black man, heard groans emanating from the shop. He roused the neighborhood and convened a small posse to guard the store. When members of the crowd forced the door open, quote, a ghastly sight met their view. Mr. Evans was lying on a bed in the rear of the building. His head was, quote, crushed in as if by several blows of an ax and the bed clothes fearfully saturated with his blood. The small crowd combed every corner of the store looking for Evans' assailant. Carrie Massey was reportedly discovered, quote, hid away beside a pile of shucks. She was pulled out of her hiding place and her apron and bonnet were found to be spotted with blood, end quote. News of the murder spread swiftly throughout the community. A large mob assembled at the scene of the killing and a proposition was made to lynch Massey. However, the quote, calm voice of a minister of the gospel was heard and the mob reluctantly abandoned the project. Sheriff Walcott escorted Ma Massey to the county jail where a reporter was standing by to collect a statement from the 16-year-old girl about the murder. What made you kill him, asked the journalist. I didn't kill him, I don't know nothing about it. I ain't killed nobody, replied Massey. She went on to explain. I went away from Macon last night on the train, and you can ask the conductor if I didn't. I got off there at Summerfield, and I was going to see some people that I know. It was so dark and cold that I didn't want to be out there in the woods by myself, so I goes to Mr. Evans' store and knocks. Mr. Evans comes to the door, and I tells him that I want to come in and stay till morning. When the train came by about 3 o'clock, I saw a man strike a match. I thought he was in the store all the time, and after a while, I heard the licks on Mr. Evans and heard him say, Oh, Lord. Then I heard somebody on the outside, and I was so scared I didn't know what to do. When the daylight came, I heard the crowd outside say they would kill the first person they came out of the store. And I hid behind the shucks, and that's all I know about it. Matthew's de declaration of innocence fell on deaf ears. Recognizing the hopeless nature of her circumstances, she challenged authorities to, quote, just do what you please with me, I don't care. Notwithstanding the fact that prior to her indictment, she had never been accused, let alone convicted, of committing or conspiring to commit any act of violence, the young woman was forced to exchange her bloodstained blood dress for a striped one and to toil in Georgia's ruthless convict lease system. So flash forward 10 years later. By the time Carrie Massey arrived at the Camp Herbmont prison farm in 1892, she was no longer a young Negro girl but a full-grown woman who had given birth to, quote, four children, and in each instance, the child bore unmistakable signs that the father was white. She had been raped. After 10 years confinement in Georgia's private lease camps, Massey was reduced to a, quote, plaything of beastly passion. Even while floating in a sea of handsome women at Camp Herdmont, she still stood out as a preferred target. As reported by reformer Selena Sloan Butler, the bond woman's captors, quote, became so infatuated with her that peace did not always reign within the camp among the guards, end quote. Like so many female captives, Massey's path from adolescence to womanhood was paved in pain. Everywhere her feet touched, between the quarry and the field, the wash house and the stockade, the whipping post and the rapist's clutch, her deathbed and the dissection table, she suffered unceasing insults to her humanity. In February 1895, just one month after giving birth to her last child, 26-year-old Carrie Massey and her newborn died at Camp Herdmont. Mm. An inquest was ordered and the two corpses were sent in for autopsy to determine their causes of death. It was concluded that the mother died of puperal sepsis, also known as childbed fever, a bacterial infection of the female reproductive organs caused by the introduction of contaminated forceps 
or other unhygienic medical implements into the bond woman's genital tract during delivery. The infant reportedly died of starvation in the course of its mother's illness. Newspaper articles um, played an indispensable role in helping me to tell Massey's story. These sources provided the missing details that I needed and couldn't find elsewhere. And this was true for the entire book. To get the full story of the lived and laboring experiences of Southern black women prisoners, I had to use these problematic sources and read them against other records. The names, dates, locations, details of events, and other specific facts that couldn't be determined from the official record were found in abundance in racist editorials. Through the use of conservative white newspapers that hyperbolized and pathologized black female criminality, I was able to get rare evidences, including statements from female convicts, as in the case of Carrie Massey, that were unavailable elsewhere. Whipping reports. And an administrative instrument used to inventory the acts of violence and terror meted out against male and female victims in Georgia's convict lease camps played an equally important role in helping me to understand the outsized impact violence had on the lives of black female convicts. Whipping bosses hired by leases and endorsed by the state meticulously notated every stroke and strike tendered by the lash and they cited the name of every wrongdoer and the content of his or her, quote, misdeeds. But these narratives of cruelty and suffering actually served an important additional function for me. I found that by examining the types of offenses for which bond women were punished, as opposed to scrutinizing the processes of punishment alone, one is better able to ascertain the habits of dissent cultivated among female incarcerates. Women prisoners forged a unique culture of dissent in response to the power structure of the Southern penal system and made use of public techniques and private techniques of subversion. Bond women malingered, feigned illness, stole, disobeyed orders, set fires, ran away, fought camp guards, cursed their superiors, and destroyed property. While most female convicts used acts of day-to-day -day resistance in their attempts to thwart the state-sponsored attack on their self-worth, Others made more d dramatic displays of their discontent. They ran away. Some absconded in hopes of securing freedom from other overwork. Others fled physical and or sexual abuse and tyranny. <laughs> Women like Maddie Crawford, you see pictured here, um, used public and private acts of resistance to help sustain themselves in their journey through unfreedom's wild territory. In 1896, Crawford was convicted of murdering her abusive stepfather and sentenced to serve a life term in the Georgia State Penitentiary. She was sent to the Chattahoochee Brickyard where she spent the first three, three years of her sentence. As stated by an unnamed reporter for the Atlanta Constitution newspaper, quote, after being there a while, oh, excuse me, E.C. Bruffy was his name. Um, after being there a while, her great strength and activity caused those in charge of her to plan heavy work for her. She expressed a desire to become a blacksmith, and she was taught the trade. Bruffy also makes mention of the fact that, quote, with her skirts being in the way, the guards forced her to put on the trousers. Several whippings were necessary to make her consent to this. While I am doubtful that Crawford had much choice in the matter, I believe her decision to, quote, comply with learning the blacksmith trade was an act of self-preservation. Unable to physically resist her captors' attempts to defeminize her, Crawford resorted to the use of a different resistance technique. She feigned complicity and took advantage of the perks afforded her. Yet within, I believe she secretly affirmed her womanhood, using her proficiency as an ironsmith as a measurement of her own feminine identity. In prison for a lifetime, Crawford also opted to use her skills to temporarily liberate herself from the physical constraints of prison life. Just the same, by embracing masculine garb and practicing male-oriented labor, she contested the imposed heterosexual violence levied against the black female body. While male clothing certainly did not make an African-American woman impervious to sexual assault, it is still quite possible that Crawford used her dress and vocation as a blacksmith to redirect the gaze of her captors and to refashion the way in which her body was framed by her keepers and the system as a whole. In essence, 
She bent her gender identity in the same way that she bent the iron for the sake of her own survival. My intellectual investment um, and commitment to telling the stories of incarcerated women like Ella Gamble, Eliza Randall, Carrie Massey, and Maddie Crawford was my, pri excuse me, <clears throat> was my primary motive for writing Chain and Silence. But there is a much more personal reason why I wrote this book. I am the great granddaughter of Georgia sharecroppers who lived and labored under the fog of Jim Crow Georgia and weathered the same climate of terror as the women I write about. Mm. My great grandfather, Leon Johnson, was born in 1903 in LaGrange, Georgia. Mm. My great grandmother, Leola, how cute is that, was born in 1904 in a town called Rough Edge, appropriately named, not too far from LaGrange. So I wrote about Grandma Leola um, in the prologue to Change in Silence, and I'll share some of the reflections with you now and then um, prepare to close. And this is Grandma Leola, by the way. Hey, Grandma. All right. This book is an effort to give, uh, excuse me, this book is an effort to give voice to a group that has been too long silent. There was no greater inspiration for this effort than memories of my great grandmother, a woman of quiet dissemblances, meaningful pauses, and reticence when it came to sharing too much about the past. Born in 1904 in Troop County, Georgia, to a family of sharecroppers, Grandma Leola had a mental strong box filled with memories. Though occasionally she would unfetter her recollections and reveal the details of her life, there was much about her youth that never left that sacred container. As a young girl, I spent many Saturday afternoons at my great-grandparents' charming little house on Harvest Lane. I would whiz through the front gate with my mother trailing behind and make my way to the front porch where Grandma, lose the D, called Grandma, would be sitting on a sun-bleached wooden bench scouting the pretty cars, rowdy chillings, and strangers passing by. And those are her words. Among the neighborhood folks, she was renowned for her ability to wield an ax like a samurai, wring a chicken's neck with half a twist, turn fried meat in her bare hands, and flip blazing hot cornbread into her leathery palms without scalding her flesh. And I'm not exaggerating. And you did not want to spank it from her. <laughs> Our greeting was always the same. Hi, Grandma. Hi, baby. Next, she would bend down to hug me. Her skin looked and felt like chocolate pudding, and her powder-scented dresses gave off a faint scratching sound whenever she moved. Then I would tiptoe past her snuff can and spit bucket and take a seat on the bench. Now and then, Grandma would reach into her heart and offer me a tiny morsel of her life history. I enjoyed watching the light come into Grandma's eyes as she proudly spoke about birthing all 13 of them chillings or the days my great-grandfather spent, uh, spent making a fool out of himself trying to woo her. She would say, your grandpa was a pretty man and he was attractive. All them gals wanted him but me, not me. Then an earthquake of laughter would shake her entire body. But when I would ask what it was like coming of age in Rough Edge, a rural farming town on the outer edge of LaGrange, Georgia, all of that joy would vanish. A vulnerability would enter her eyes. She would run her wide fingertips across her wrinkled forehead. In a low, serious tone, she would say things like, child, them white folks was something else in my day. Couldn't cross them tracks after dark. Mama, Jessie Lee, Sally Fanny, and Willie, her older siblings, worked hard in the fields because my daddy gone dead. Her father died when she was six. Me and Horace got us some schooling, though. I got real good with my reading and writing, then I had to start helping out. We was real po, but when we got grown, we got us some families and we ain't never get no trouble. Nah, suh. So for her, a badge of pride was that none of her children ever went to prison. So on this subject, Grandma Leola was never quite clear. Her sentences broke off and ran together, forcing me to read between obscure lines to understand her. When she died at age 95, she left me with more questions than answers. What unnamed indignities has she endured at the hands of Southern white folks? Why does she so esteem her reproductive power and find it essential to publicly reinscribe her femininity by conceiving and birthing many chillings? Why, despite the racial and gendered barriers strewn in her path, did she dare to hope literacy would improve her ability to maneuver the rough terrain of poverty and exclusion? Why did she endorse a strict code of respectability almost exclusively steeped in obedience to law and order? 
And why did the specter of white racial hostility, violence, terror, and legal uh, subjugation bewilder her recollections, causing her to conceal certain segments of the past? In writing this book, I have studied my great grandmother's pain and come face to face with more than a handful of excruciating troops. I found that Troop County, Georgia, the place Grandma Leola called home, was the headquarters for the worst chain gang in Georgia. It was a place where, quote, fearless, hardened men from other camps who had escaped and were re recaptured, and those who were without friends or political aid were brutalized for not keeping the lick. Among these men was Robert Burns, a white northern miscreant whose classic expose, I am a fugitive from a Georgia chain gang, revealed one part of the human tragedy taking place in Grandma Leola's backyard, but not all of it. The other side of that calamity forms the subject of this book. In 1903, the year Burns' memoir was published, five black women were sentenced to hard labor on the Troop County chain gang. Nearly 200 others were forced to toil in labor camps scattered throughout the state of Georgia. For nearly a century, the specter of mass imprisonment haunted black Georgians, women included. Respectable ladies like Grandma Leola, as well as the more rebellious echelon of Freedom's daughters, were all burdened by Southern injustice. They coexisted in a milieu where the threat of incarceration was omnipresent. Thus, Chained in Silence is as much an attempt to excavate the memories Grandma Leola dared to forget as it is an opportunity to give voice to the women still waiting to be heard. I am very grateful that through the work of myself, Professor Sarah Haley, Mary Ellen Curtin, um, through their work, these women's voices have finally been heard. But there are so many that have not. May we all commit to breaking the silences that exist around incarcerated women's experiences in the past and present, and may we all raise our voices in defense of black women. Their lives depend on it, our lives depend on it. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Sarah Haley. She's an associate professor in the Department of Gender Studies at UCLA, where she started in 2011. She earned her doctorate in African and Af in American Studies at Yale University in 2011, and her master's in 2007. She also holds a BA in Political Science from Vassar College. This evening, she will be speaking about her recent pathbreaking and prize-winning book, No Mercy Here, Gender, Punishment, and the Making of Jim Crow Modernity, which was published also by the University of North Carolina Press in 2016. No Mercy Here has received the 2016 Letitia Woods Brown Memorial Prize for Best Book from the Association of Black Women's Historians. It also, received, uh, it also received the Sarah Whaley Prize for Best Book on Women in Labor from the National Women's Studies Association. Her new research project intends to examine gender and the making of the carceral state. everyone, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, I am really honored to receive this invitation to come speak from Professor Trotter. Um, and I'm really grateful to Hikari Ade for all of the work that she put into um, bringing us all here. It's great to be in conversation with Kevin and Talitha. And Talitha and I rarely have the opportunity to talk to each other about how our work developed, um, so it's a great chance for us to think about the field of black feminists, histories of the carceral state, and as an admirer of her work, it's just really wonderful to be in this conversation. Um, so we were asked to talk today a bit about the making of our books. So I'm mostly gonna focus on some questions of methodology and some of the um, context for bringing me to this subject. But to give a brief overview, No Mercy Here examines imprisoned women's experiences of punishment from roughly the 1870s through the 1930s. And it explores the role of gendered regimes of incarceration in the making of racial ideology. So essentially what I argue is that 
um, the punishment of black women in convict lease camps and chain gangs was necessary for the fortification of white supremacy, for the entrenchment of white supremacist ideas about race and gender. And essentially, the reason for that is because black women's disproportionate punishment, the disproportionate um, regimes of violence that Talitha just um, wrenchingly detailed, um, really, they really exemplified black female difference from white womanhood. And so the representations of that violence, as well as the infliction of that violence, signaled broader racial hierarchies. So um, I trace black women's disproportionate prosecution for a range of criminalized acts um, and discourses and popular representations of criminalized black women. I look at their labor in a range of industries, including public roads, railroads, brick making, iron ore extraction, coal mining, lumber, and agricultural labor. I also trace the development of laws around uh, convict labor. So in 1908, the chain gang um, was established to, to replace convict leasing. Under convict leasing, imprisoned women and men would work for private companies doing the grueling work um, that uh, we have described. And in 1908, that system was abolished and the chain gang uh, replaced it. And under the chain gang, under the same brutal conditions of terrorization, um, constant whippings, illness, neglect, prisoners would now be forced to work construct, primarily constructing public roads. So the law establishing this new system exempted women from the chain gang. Uh, literally it read, um, if females be convicted, they will be sent to the state farm rather than the chain gang. But, but from 1908 to 1936, the years in which the chain gang was in operation, only four white women ever slipped through the cracks and were sent to the chain gang, compared to nearly 2,000 women, black women, 2,000 black women. So it's an example of how the law actually constructed ideas about race and gender, and how judges interpreted and reinforced those ideas, and essentially this moment which could be read as just a moment of criminal punishment legislation, really is a way of enforcing ideas of black women's exclusion from the category of womanhood. So I sort of look at moments like that to try and think about ideology. Um, I also examine the institutionalization of sexual violence and the pervasiveness of emotional and physical violence, including whipping that was exacted against black women, and forms of everyday and extraordinary forms of resistance, um, including the creation of blues, um, which critiques uh, established ideas about the criminal punishment system. And I actually don't have a straightforward answer about how I came to this project. Instead, there are fragments um, and intellectual influences and kind of episodes or moments that as I look back, emerge as pivotal. In some ways, it began when I picked up Asada, an autobiography from my father's bookshelf around my freshman year in high school. Of the night she was shot and apprehended by the police, As Asada Shakur wrote, quote, a rough voice asked, is she dead yet? I wondered how long the ambulance had been sitting there. The attendants looked nervous. The bubbles in my chest felt like they were growing bigger. When they burst, my whole chest shattered. I faded again, and it was down south in the summertime. I thought about my grandmother. At last, the ambulance was moving. If I live, I remember thinking, I'll only have one arm. Later in the hospital, Asada recalls of the police. One sticks his fingers in my eyes. I don't know what he has on his fingertips, but whatever it is burns like hell. I think I'm going to be blind forever. He says he will keep doing it until I am completely blind. Reading that passage and the rest of the book at a relatively young age changed something in me. It altered my conception of the magnitude of state violence that could be imposed upon black women. It stayed with me as I went to college and began getting involved in anti-prison organizing and eventually prison abolition, and this is in the 1990s. 
Um, that context represents another key influence for the development of No Mercy here. Although many anti-prison organizers at the time were highlighting the specific conditions and consequences facing criminalized and imprisoned women, and scholars including Angela Davis highlighted the intersection of race and gender in the crisis of mass incarceration, most mainstream and popular accounts at the time still included women, excluded women in discussions about the prison industrial complex. It is as if black women were not there. But what was interesting and perhaps um, important for this discussion is that this exclusion of black women relied upon a historical narrative. As the story went, the contemporary problem of mass incarceration was an extension of previous regimes of captivity and terror, namely slavery, lynching, race riots, and convict leasing. As the story went, black men had suffered extreme violence in these historical moments that extended into present day modes of policing and imprisonment. This preceded the work by historians like Crystal Feimster, who gendered the history of lynching, so you should read her book, Southern Horrors, or the work of Callie Gross and Cheryl Hicks, who produced really monumental accounts of black women and incarceration. Um, before these books, and in some ways, even after many of these books, the story was all about sort of the black male subject of white supremacist violence. And, and convict leasing was really pivotal to this story. So I entered grad school in African American studies and American studies with the intention of disrupting this masculinist narrative in many ways, um, really mirroring what Talitha described. And I wanted to make uh, the state's technologies of state violence um, against black women visible. But I actually had no intention of doing historical work. My loose plan was to do a cultural studies project that focused on how judges and prosecutors relied upon notions of black women's pathology in their judicial decisions, in modes of um, enforcing the law, um, and in, in sentencing. And I wanted to think about the impact of these ideas about black women um, on black women's lives, the kind of sentences they face, the kinds of um, uh, separation they face from families. Um, but I wanted to think about it in contemporary context. I had been working as a paralegal for the pu a public defender office, and at this moment I was immersed in critical race feminism. So I was influenced by scholars like Dorothy Roberts and Patricia Williams. So I wanted to examine the work of the law, how juridical systems gain their power to impose violence against black women precisely by denying bias and exalting the kind of standards of reasonableness and objectivity and neutrality upon which the law relies. I couldn't shake the image of fingertips in Asada's eyes, and I wanted to understand the afterlife of that particular blindness in our current moment. So in some ways, I came to history interested in a problem rather than a method. But methodological yeah. models were critical. In my first year of coursework, I first read Tara Hunter's brilliant book, To Joy My Freedom, and that was another transformative text. It altered how we understand black women's significance in a kind of post-Civil War political economy by producing a history of black women domestic workers in Atlanta and in Georgia um, and their resistance. And she really exposed black women's political consciousness and their critiques of racial capitalism. So it was a model of how to think about representation, resistance, and cultural expression. She also looks at dance and the blues. And so as someone who at th that point really thought about, OK, what's animating ideology? How do ideologies get formed? It provided this dramatic example of how an analysis of change over time could really explode understandings of power. So since convict leasing was so central to these popular discussions about precedents for mass incarceration, I decided to attempt to write a social and cultural history to examine the long historical moment of convict leasing as a gendered one, and as one in which black women's lives mattered. When I made my first research trip to Georgia, the Georgia State Archives, I was confronted with skepticism. One of the lead archivists, Dale Couch, had worked with Alex Lichtenstein on his history of convict leasing in Georgia. 
twice the work of free labor. So he led me expertly through the source materials, and he was helpful in every way possible. But there was an archival assistant, and he was the one who was tasked with sitting in the reading room as researchers look, looked at archival materials, basically, to make sure that we didn't steal anything or ruin anything. Um, and he was more dubious. And often, I was the only researcher in the room at a given time. And he would make conversation as I was going through the records. So on my first day with him in the reading room, he asked me about my project. And I explained that I was writing a dissertation about black women's experiences in convict leasing. He responded, you're not going to find anything about that here. We didn't do that to women. He was adamant that women were not in convict camps. And he was confident, asking, have you seen Gone with the Wind? I nodded. <laughs> that was accurate, he said. It was just like that, male convicts. I'm not sure what the appropriate response should have been. I just kept nodded, nodding and trying to look through files as fast as possible. And he just kept insisting that black women were not in convict camps, even as I was pulling photographs of imprisoned women from the files that hadn't been cataloged. In that moment, I couldn't have been more grateful that I had begun my research by reading the scathing accounts of black women's brutalization in convict camps by Selena Sloan Butler, who Talitha mentioned, and Mary Church Charles and other women, uh, members of the National Association of Co uh, Colored Women. I knew that this had happened, even if at that point I was unsure of how much evidence I would find to confirm it. The literal guardian of the archive acted much like the judges who I intended to write about in my original dissertation topic, disavowing at every turn that black women's violation is foundational to legal systems of control. In some ways, he was a proxy for the historical figures that I discussed who did not consider black women women and therefore could violate them with the fiercest brutality imaginable. In some ways, he also stands in for the dubiousness of scholars who at various moments have characterized black women's history and the histories of black women and the carceral state as irrelevant, small, unnecessary. There were not enough women to matter, one of them said to me midway through my graduate career. For the rest of my time, I want to talk about two specific moments in the research and writing that were particularly important. The first was a trip to the Keenan Research Center at the Atlanta History Center, where I was fortunate to encounter an amazing archivist named Beth McLean. One day as I was looking through some papers, she kind of casually looked up from her desk. Um, and she said offhandedly, you know, I think I have some ledgers in the back somewhere. I think they're uncatalogued. I hope I can find them. Um, words that you sort of pray that you'll hear from Artemis. Um, so I looked up thinking ledgers, that sounds promising, but I didn't really know what she was talking about. Um, and she emerged a while, a while later with these huge ledger books with, from Atlanta's magistrate court from the 1880s and 1890s. And in them were entries for black women's appearances in court for things like throwing dirty water in the street, cursing in the presence of a white woman, and disorderly conduct after disorderly conduct after disorderly conduct. Mm -hmm. Alongside each crime was the annotation to streets. After that, in researching the system of street labor that was disproportionately carried out by black women, I was able to trace an institution that had received little t attention by historians whose emphasis had been on the county and state chain gangs. Um, but I really wanted to understand what to streets mean. What did that look like? But black, so I eventually discovered that black people were sent to local convict camps where they would be made to break rocks that were then used to fill city streets. This institution had its own rules, its own culture and rhythm, and it was critical to the landscape of Atlanta as the capital of the New South whose good streets reflected the city's modernity. It was also gendered with some of the, these local camps comprised exclusively of black women. In others, black women were the majority. City officials estimated that these rock brigades would break enough rock to pave every street in Atlanta and build a wall around the city. So searching for black women who were buried in the archive of Southern Punishment led me down this road to find places where they were more prominent. 
providing a critical lesson, I think, about how his searching for his uh, excluded his historical actors, especially black women, it does not simply add new figures to the historical record, but it has the potential to provide new insight into broader systems of subordination and subjection, economic development and exploitation. The other moment I want to discuss came way at the end of the process of writing No Mercy Here. One of the reviewers of the book manuscript after it was sent out to the press suggested that I could take greater authorial control of the book, directing the narrative more, pushing harder in specific moments against archival absences, even if speculative. I remember reading these suggestions thinking I want to do this. How do I do this? So I rewrote, one of the ways that I did it was to rewrite the introduction to chapter two of the book as I was staring down a deadline to turn in the revised manuscript. I tried to think about what it might mean to take hold of the narrative by beginning that chapter, which describes the most brutal forms of terror exacted against black women, uh, to begin that chapter with an archivally informed but speculative account of care and black sociality to frame a section that included seemingly endless instances of rape, death, disease, dismemberment, and emotional agony with what was wholly erased in the archive, which were the moments of support and love. Moments that might never have existed since they were not recounted by those who left existing material, but they must have existed, right? So in that section I wrote, she was already tired by the time she made it to the place where she was sent to work. More than 100 miles from home, Adeline Henderson saw hundreds of other people in her predicament when she arrived at Dade County coal mines. All men, all striped, faces dirty from the coke ovens and the mines. Where would she sleep? It wasn't until deep dark that she met Nancy Morris, who would stay in the bed next to her. For her part, Nancy was relieved that finally, after three months, another woman had come to the camp and they would share sleeping quarters. In arguably the worst camp in the state, it was the worst time to arrive at Dade. 1884 was a cold year and the harvest did not yield, so there were no vegetables to be had. Despite the colds, the air was still stifling in the two scarcely ventilated barracks. Meat was also scarce, so they ate only cornbread and syrup for months and months and months. Nancy told Adeline that they would have to get up before the sun, earlier than everyone else, to get the camp ready for work. Then they would go to the Coke ovens. That first night, Nancy told Adeline that soon she wouldn't notice the smell and the dirt so much. The cotton seemed less infested when your, lead, your head is lead heavy. Over the next few days, Nancy showed Adeline how to get the water and boil the lye and mend the clothes and make the cornbread and how to help the men in the red hot fire of the Coke ovens. Adeline mentioned that everyone at home called her Addie. Years later, Nancy and Adeline learned that they would be moving, not getting out, just moving, but they would be going together. They wondered if the next place would be worse. Nancy wondered if there would be Coke ovens. This would be the longest journey yet, past Nancy's sister in Newton and Adeline's children in Cobb County, past Atlanta, Stone Mountain, and Athens. It took more than a day until they made it to the smaller camp. When they arrived, they looked at each other, stunned to find that the other prisoners were women. If they made it out of Dade, they could definitely make it out of this hard mark place. Like others in the camp, Nancy caught the debilitating all-overs, and the pain seemed to be everywhere. Her neck was always wet from the tears, and she never rested, but doctors said the pain was in Nancy's mind. Adeline visited Nancy in the sick quarters when she caught fever, and they scowled at the guards for making Nancy leave after only four days, when she was still clearly not well. Adeline was the first to notice that Nancy began to slack in the fields when she normally moved so fast. She asked what was wrong, but Nancy didn't have an answer. When the guards failed to quicken Nancy's pace with lashes, she was again put in the camp hospital bed in severe pain from the lacerations and from the jolts in her bones. Adeline came every night with verses and questions and demands blinking hard and often, determined not to let tears leave her eyes. 
are you better? She would ask on May 17th and 18th and 19th. And every day until after two weeks, Nancy was better. The pain in her legs, not only a dull ache and the throbbing had subsided. To try to speculate ethically meant to return to every count account of the women who were the subject of that section, Nancy Morris and Adeline Henderson. I poured back over all of their materials to create timelines of when they were at Dade coal mines and maps of how the trip from Dade to Hardmont, a women's camp where they ended up, um, would look to try to develop even further the context for their experiences, searching through newspapers and almanacs, redrafting notes from annual prison reports and stick reports, because my questions were different when I tried to write a story about their experiences together, rather than one of individual violation. In addition to the question of the extent of their illnesses, I became interested in who was in the sick area with them. Would their conversations have been overheard? Who else was there for them to talk to? Did Adeline know that her lover Moses was trying to get her released? And would she have anyone to tell about it? Such impossible questions haunt black women's history and the project of trying to ascertain glimpses of black women's inner lives. My, anal my analytical framework for this section was critical fabulation, which is drawn from Cydia Hartman's essay, Venus in Two Acts. In that essay, she asks, how does one tell impossible stories? Stories about girls bearing names that deface and dis disfigure. About the words exchanged between shipmates that never acquired any standing in the law and failed to be recorded in the archive. About the appeals, prayers, and secrets never uttered because no one was there to receive them. The furtive communication that might have passed between two girls but which no one among the crew observed. She argues for fashion, fashioning a narrative based upon a critical reading of the archive that mimes the figurative dimensions of history to tell impossible stories and amplify the impossibility of the stories in the archive. She turns to the subjunctive, what might have been. And the subjunctive has been sort of taken up by scholars as a writing practice to really emphasize and be explicit about what uh, might have been. But um, what's interesting to me about that is that it is actually more intimately tied to the research practice of narrative historians than is often acknowledged. I was deeply impacted by the way, this way of seeing historical figures and historical relationships um, about what it meant to speculate about what a ritual of care might have looked like in the aftermath of sexual violence carried out against women by imprisoned guards. Um, I yeah, will skip a little bit. I will just close, because I think I'm over time, by saying that the title of No Mercy Here came from the lyrics of a song uh, titled Long Line, written by Alma Hicks in Parchman Penitentiary in the 1930s. And at the end of the book, in the last chapter, I discuss the blues as a criticism, not just a reflection of black women's experiences in prison, so that was really important, but as a criticism of the operation of the law, of, of the sort of forms of reasonability and objectivity, and therefore a real a precursor to critical race feminism, which was one of the things that really provoked me to do this work in the first place. Um, and so I'll end with uh, the, song, the song that uh, Alma Hicks wrote in Parchman Penitentiary in the 1930s, um, where the book title is from. I don't think it was ever recorded, but I'll just end this talk by reading her words, with which both, um, I think, dramatically critique the kind of capriciousness, unpredictability of state actors, and imprisonment as a system that attacks black women specifically and particularly, and the brutality of prison conditions as labor. Here it goes, long line. This long line is killing me. He wakes me up in the morning by that old iron hitting dang, 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 and roll from sun to sun. Oh, this long line is killing me. I wrote to the governor and asked him to please turn me loose. He wrote and told me, girl, I will look over your case. Let me tell you girls, it ain't no mercy here. Lord, catching this long line is killing me. It's so many women here and so many different kind. 
some high yellows, but I'm a chocolate brown. Mm -hmm. This long line is killing me. Thank you. So we, uh, we have uh, about a half hour, at least, reserved for questions. Uh, I'm sure there are many. Don't be bashful. <laughs> yes, Joe. Because, because your evidence is on Georgia. I'd like you guys to talk a little bit about the contrast with Alabama in terms of the way they treated the prison women, black women. Um, well, in terms of Alabama, one of the, I can talk a little bit about some of the differences between the ways in which um, incarcerated women experienced you know, captivity and much of what we just described in Alabama as opposed to in Georgia. One of the things that um, was striking to me was the fact that even though these women suffered the same types of violence, the same types of you know brutality, um, and they were still commodified to an extent, but it was more of like, I think of a sort of domestic economy in the sense that they weren't working on chain gangs, they weren't building roads, they weren't making bricks, they weren't working in mines, but they were doing primarily domestic um, labor, which was still very important in a different kind of economy, but it wasn't contributing to the political economy in the way that incarcerated women's labor did in, in Georgia. So that's one of the, the you know, differences that I see between how the Georgia model compares to the Alabama model. But yeah, I was going to say something really similar. Georgia had the most diverse set of convict yeah. leasing industries, and so the experiences of imprisoned women would have varied quite a bit even within Georgia, depending on if you were in a coal mining camp or a brick making camp. I mean, there would be some brutal similarities, mm -hmm. but the labor would be different, and black women were in every single convict camp in Georgia, in Georgia. that I could find. Mm -hmm. I did not find one camp in which there wasn't, or at least a few black women imprisoned in some for mm -hmm. some amount of time. So um, yeah, I would agree. I think it's the diversity of the industries. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, I would say that in Alabama, there was more sex segregation, too. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. in Georgia, incarcerated mm -hmm. women worked alongside men mm -hmm. at one point in time mm -hmm. and were wearing men's clothes and brogans mm -hmm. and the like. And so they don't actually begin to separate women prisoners until like the 1880s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so from, the, from the inception of convict leasing in 1868 up until that point, these women were working in male prison camps. Now, they may have been placed in separate quarters to sleep, but there's a lot of evidence that they did actually work alongside men. And I think about the case of Lizzie Boatwright mm -hmm. and other women who, you know, um, were discovered dressed like men, working like men, mm -hmm. but that you don't see that in Alabama. So, yeah, I agree. Uh, what effect has working on this had on you? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a hard question to answer, although I think it's such an important question. Sometimes I try, I think the only way that I could get through writing this book is to try and ignore that question, like mm -hmm. to try and say hey, this is not about me because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. so brutal that I mm -hmm. kind of felt like if I started to think about my own feelings a lot, I just wouldn't keep writing. So um, that's sort of how I tried to deal with it during writing the book, after, but in the aftermath of it, I think, um, you know, you don't see the world the same way, I don't think, after being immersed in like records of this kind of terrorization. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way to sort of um, uh, forget, you know, you mm -hmm. think about it every day and it motivates 
me to mm -hmm. do more work around mm -hmm. um, imprisoned women um, in the current prison industrial complex, right? So I do uh, work with California Coalition for Women Prisoners um, and some o other organizing, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that I was invested in before, but I think that mm -hmm. now I kind of constantly see Mm, I guess the historical connections just mm -hmm. in a, a more salient way, in a vivid way. It's kind of like going from going to Technicolor and seeing mm -hmm. kind of every circumstance, the historical connections. I, I agree wholeheartedly with every single thing <laughs> that Sarah just said. I was going to say much of the same thing in the sense that um, I felt like, you know, it made me not just into a better scholar, but a better human being and a more compassionate human being. Um, I really didn't know things were that bad until, you know, I became immersed and invested in these records. And it made me much more invested in incarcerated women's lives today. So, you know, even though much of the work is written about the past and mirrors the present, you know, the, the really the present, the past, is a window into the present, you know, and so um, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Sarah said in regards to how it helped me to um, to be, you know, a better person and to work more, work harder for incarcerated women. One, two. Yes. Hello. Uh, I'm I'm uncertain now which of you referred to the fact, but uh, I recall hearing the fact that despite a state statute barring courts from sending women to chain gangs, nonetheless, 2,000 African-American mm -hmm. women went to the, was that, was that your presentation mm -hmm. or your own? It was your, okay. Uh, and, and whereas only four uh, white women mm -hmm. who also shouldn't have gone went to the chain gang. Now, obviously, there is disparate treatment by the judge there, but it, it piqued my curiosity as to what was going on in court because normally when you have a judge handing down some sort of sentence that has something legally objectionable about it, the defendant would have an opportunity to appeal that sentence. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering why that didn't happen. Is it because there, you know, this is before Gideon v. Wainwright, so no one has the right to have a court-appointed attorney, and you have yeah. women who just don't know what their rights are, uh -huh. or is there something else going on? I would say there's sorry, something else going on. So I can tell you, I can be more specific about the law, which is that the law said something to the effect of if the convict be female, the judge may in his discretion sentence her to the state farm at Milledgeville. It operates as a mandate in the sense that you know, for 30 years, only four white women go there. Um, judges, it was not illegal to send um, women to convict camps, but it was expressly pers prescribed basically that they shouldn't be sent there. And through judicial reinterpretation reinterpreta and reinforcement over and over again, a sort of the law is codified right, and recodified um, as an exemption, a sort of blanket exemption. Because black women were not considered women, right, they were not, um, they were not sent to the state farm. Should they, I mean, had they appealed, I don't think it would have resulted in any different treatment, right? Like, I don't think an appellate court judge First of all, it, it, it was legally possible to send women to chain gangs. It just wasn't done. Um, but I also think, you know, we're operating under Jim Crow law, right? Where in many ways, judicial interpretation is not even following sort of the rule of the law. Um, but what is interesting about that law is that the fir after 1908, the first sort of, um, there are two women who come to the court's attention 
after this 1908 law passes. And they're sort of these vagrant women who are sexually disorderly and who they're ba basically banned from the town that they, they, they live in. They're banished, these two white women. And so they wind up arrested for a misdemeanor conviction. And there are letters back and forth between sen the sentencing commission, um, or sorry, the penitentiary commission, and who, which operates all of the the prison camps and the judge and they and the judge says we have these two women in front of me, like this new law has passed. What shall we do with them? And the state um, prison commission writes back to the judge and says, are are the women black or white? And the judge says, the women are white will send them to the state farm. And that's like basically the precedent that thereafter every sort of judge is operating on. The age range between you know, the youngest to the oldest, what was the age range of the women in the prison? The youngest person that you found, 11, 12? I I think the youngest I found was a 13-year-old girl who was sent to the Fulton County chain gang, was put in the bucket machine uh -huh. and flogged. Um, yeah. I think that that's the youngest that I've seen. Um, so, But in terms of the age range, usually most women incarcerated during this period range between like, you know, 17 to 30. I would yeah. say that was kind of the... But, but no, but I think I found someone as young as 12 who was sentenced to a year on the chain gang, and mm -hmm. there were women in their 50s and 60s who were oh, sent yeah, to definitely. the convict police camp. So, but that's the majority, but you, you know, there was no sort of e mm -hmm. exemption. Black girls in particular were sent to the local convict camps often. Mm -hmm. Age definitely didn't protect black women, because yeah. there was no protection yeah. for black women. They weren't worthy of being protected. Um, thank you for your time. I wanted to ask, um, could you both talk about how you, your particular work has influenced your current view of the current prison industrial complex? And what were some of those historical similarities that you mm -hmm. both mentioned? Sure. You want to go first, Lisa, or I can um, to you? Sure. I, hmm. Well, the similarities that I see, um, so I'm working with, I'm doing this work now with um, the Fluvana Women's Correctional Facility in um, Charlottesville. I don't know, well, not in Charlottesville, it's right outside of Charlottesville. And I don't know if you recently read a Washington Post article where um, Fluvana is like implicated, well, the guards and um, the facility in particular is actually being, there's a class action lawsuit among some of the prisoners there and formerly incarcerated women who have claimed that you know their medical needs went neglected, that some of the women, um, the family members are suing because their family members died from not getting um, adequate medical care. One woman who was profiled in the Washington Post about a month ago talked about how she complained of pain in her leg and they ended up amputating her leg when all they had to do was to attend to it in the first place. So I see like a lot of this from a medical perspective, there's a lot of overlap in terms of, you know, the outright neglect. Um, when I think about menacing reproduction, the effects of like how, how that plays out today with the shackling of women prisoners and how um, incarcerated women, you know, are oftentimes in, have people, women have reported giving birth by themselves in these cells, babies dying, women getting sick, women dying. I mean, there's just all this horrific um, stuff that happens to, you know pregnant women in prison, black women, black and brown women. So I do see some parallels there as well in, in addition to, you know, all the other like mm -hmm. violence and um, and I think there's also a commodification of their non-laboring bodies. I think the state, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the prison industrial complex capitalizes off of the warehousing of mm -hmm. black women's bodies, even though there's somewhat of a laboring element, but they are still mm -hmm. commodities. So. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. And I guess in addition, I would say that there are kind of a few other similarities. Um, one is that, you know, in 1900 in Atlanta, you could get sent to a couple years on the chain gang for possessing whiskey. 
-hmm. right? And what you see is a historical precedent for a kind mm -hmm. of drug war, mm -hmm. right? For the possession of things that are now mm -hmm. legal. Um, and that's two lessons. One is the policing of, you know, um, illicit substances is a problem, but also that, the, that you know, crime is a construction. What is mm -hmm. considered a crime in one moment mm -hmm. is no longer a crime. Mm -hmm. Later, and we need to think about that as we're thinking about sentencing and laws. Um, one of the other things that comes to mind is that the chain gang was a real, really seen as a reform of convict mm -hmm. leasing. It was actually called abolition. Um, and it makes us, and you know, I think it really is important to think about what we mean by reform and what we mean by abolition. I identify as a prison abolitionist. I believe that kept that this mm -hmm. form of caging is mm -hmm. inherently violent mm -hmm. um, and not um, an answer to social problems. That there are many, there were many answers to social problems before there were prisons, mm -hmm. and that there could be many others um, if we no longer had them, and that they are always disparate. Like in this mm -hmm. country, they have um, always right been. Uh, a mode of containing the poor and containing people of color, right? So it would be pretty difficult to really think of them as being something different. Um, and I think this history really provides like mm -hmm. one of the most powerful examples of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you both for sharing your thoughts. And I'm wondering, um, you mentioned quite a bit about state and county and municipal uh, sources, but did you, uh, either of you, uh, look into um, the role of the federal government, particularly the Bureau of Public Roads and any of the work they did? I know in 1914 and 15, they collaborated with the mm -hmm. Public Health Service in Fulton County, Georgia, um, mm -hmm. and ran an experimental convict labor camp. But I didn't know if you came across any of their methods um, in your research or how the sort of expertise at the federal level may have impacted the more local communities. Yeah, I, I didn't look at um, the federal chain gang um, that would have been really experimental, like one or two small road camps. Um, the system, like in 1914, was really heavily staked at that point. Even the local municipal roads were really something that mm -hmm. was the late 19th, very early 20th century. Um, at that point, it was very much state and county camps. And so that that is what emerged most in the record. So I can't say much about that particular camp that you're referencing, but that almost all of them were state and county. And I didn't look at the federal either. But that's important, it might be. Yeah, it would be great to think about like, especially because we think about the federal government mm -hmm. as having a particular role in intervening, mm -hmm, right? Exactly. In um, that intervention did not happen <laughs> in this moment, um, in this context. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, many questions, but I'll just ask one question. Would both of you um, make a recommendation as to where do we go from here based upon your research? Oh, boy. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I don't know if people would disagree with this, but I would say that it is still really rare to think about black women who are killed by police, mm -hmm. the daily regimes of violence that black women face. Um, even when we do think about black women and police violence, we think about maybe only those who were killed, mm -hmm. right? I think that, and, and this goes for our men too, like I think we have to think about state violence differently. Um, people are sort of, the, people's lives are destroyed, say by policing every single day, even if they are not killed. They are injured, yep. their assets are seized, mm -hmm. they are losing jobs, mm -hmm. they're having tickets, right? And these are all the things, Talitha, I mean, like those records of like mm -hmm. the daily harassment mm -hmm. and ticketing mm -hmm. um, and the magnitude of like destruction in someone's life from throwing dirty water in the street mm -hmm. is, is a lesson. I think for today and how we orient ourselves around what are the problems of policing, what are the problems of criminal punishment. But I do think it really persists that we don't think about 
black women, even when, you know, um, I think Sandra Bland, right, would have been the person who was most well known um, for being killed by police, and there still were not mass protests around Sandra That's Bland, right. right? And a lot of the protests that were there, well, that did take place, um, were primarily dominated by black women. Right. So it's almost as if black women's lives don't matter. And so, um, you know, in terms of going forward, I don't have, I'm just going to be honest, I'm right there with Sarah in terms of, you know, thinking about abolition as a mode to move forward because I don't have any hope of reform. I don't trust the same people who created the system to fix it. Mm. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm very much invested in a rehabilitation and mercy model. Mm -hmm. I think that we can appropriate funds in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. and, and essentially, they're the ones making the money. You know, taxpayers, we are the ones um, that they're being forcibly complicit in the perpetuation of the prison industrial complex. You know, so it's incumbent upon us to decide, you know, that we don't want them to utilize our tax money to help perpetuate this brutal system. So I think it's everybody's job, you know, to come together to come to recognize that we are all pawns or victims of this system. Everybody. And so I think that not looking at prisoners, you know, or incarcerated people as bad people or othering them or somehow marginalizing them recognizing their humanity and recognizing that we're all a part, we are all essentially um, being, whether by force or whether we want to be or not, we are all included in this problem. And I think just to echo that and actually echo something that Talitha said earlier, I think one of the things moving forward that it's important to do is kind of rethink how we think of the economy of criminal of criminal punishment mm -hmm. and prisons, because I think we focus a lot on private prisons yeah. and uh, prison labor. But I think something that our books show and other books on convict leasing is that there was this, the system was not, not you know, just limited to specific forms of labor. Like an mm -hmm. entire economy was developed around convict leasing and the chain gang back then. And now it's not the primary profit to the state is not okay. around labor. It's um, around sort of financialization of prisons, about the ways in which prisons allow um, money to be sent um, in that direction rather than to schools, mm -hmm. rather than to right. um, hospitals, rather than to other institutions of social welfare. That is the real crisis of, um, of contemporary carceral economy. So I think our demand should be about redistribution and not right. falling for you know narratives around austerity and, and fiscal crisis, right? right. Because money is about choices. Right. And the prison sucks money into that right. choice. Um, when there could be much better ones. Our money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know, um, so first I want to thank um, all three of you, but um, the two of you in particular for focusing on the experience of women and girls. Um, my question is a bit odd, because I, I recognize and I realize that there's a deficit um, with regards to scholarship on the experience of black women and girls. But what was it about this particular historical moment that you know, presented opportunity for two books to come out um, about, you know, the experience that women and girls, you know, went through um, with the chain gain and the convict leasing system. Um, and what can we do moving forward uh, for young historians and social scientists, people in humanities, social sciences, why we should focus more on the experience of women and girls, particularly women and girls of color. Mm -hmm. Why in this moment? Like, why were we working at, on this at the same time? <laughs> Boy. Uh, you know, I think in some ways, for me, and from what I know, of, I think it in part is a political moment, right, that I think we've described around the crisis of mass incarceration that excluded black women and girls from that narrative. Mm -hmm. I think we were also building on this history of convict leasing, mm -hmm. which you said it was elusive, is that the word you used? Mm -hmm. Yes, black women and girls were elusive in that canon mm -hmm. of um, historiography. And so for mm -hmm. us, I think at these two things converge, like this historiographic exclusion and this political exclusion in the midst of such violence um, 
And this, for me, like I said, this violent precedent. I mean, everyone just sort of was like, it went from slavery to convict leasing to prisons. And at that point, people weren't talking a lot about black women in slavery. Right. And they definitely weren't talking about black women in convict leasing. So then why should anyone care about black women and mass incarceration? It's not part of the historical story. It doesn't work. So um, it's hard to build a movement around a story in which you're excluded. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I think I forgot part of the question. Sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I don't know, I don't quite know how it happened, but we're happy that it happened, right? Because one of the things that we were even discussing earlier is that if you want to get a complete picture of um, the history of black women and incarceration in post-war Georgia and have a historical context or foundation for understanding how you know mass incarceration affects black women today, and I'm not just trying to like sell books, but get these two books and read them together. They're very complementary. They've um, you know, fill gaps and they're not necessarily holes in the work, but they're they're just mm -hmm. very wedded works. We actually published on the same press with the same editor in the same series. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that they're very just I don't know some serendipitous ordering yeah. to all this. I have no idea, but all I know is it worked out well, <laughs> and we I don't want to put Sarah on front street, but there was one award that was left out of hers and one that was left out of mine. We have a combined close to 10 awards what for these I mean. two books. Yeah. So I'm just saying, and maybe counting, yeah. you know? Yeah. So the point is, the history matters. And, you know, clearly people are invested in these histories. And these awards are coming from organizations that have not recognized mm -hmm you know, black women's history, you know, in the, in the past necessarily. They have, but very, you know, rarely. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I just wanted to say that. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So you, uh, I think it was you, Sarah, who said that the chain gang, um, I, I think you said it ended or in Georgia in, in 1938. Or did you not say that? Maybe I missed that. So I yeah, I, I might have um, suggested that. It ended in the 40s, like 43. But the records that I that I looked at stopped in 1938. Oh. Well, first let me say I grew up in Atlanta. Uh huh. And I remember as a little girl seeing in DeKalb County, yeah. um, mainly African American men yeah. on, I don't know if, I mean, I'm you know, going flying by in a car. Um, you know, so it's hard to tell, but they're working in a line. Uh huh. I was sworn yes. they were in a chain gang. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so that's my, you know, just that point. If you comment, but the uh, the larger point question is, so what is the is it a post war moment of reform in Georgia? I assume this is in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so if and then talk a little bit about the maybe the women's side of the story, the larger side of the story is that is there a post, is the 40s thing a, a, a moment uh, of reform? And is there a women, a story of a women's convict labor, labor that's slightly different or just continuing the same? So that would be the larger. After the, the 40s? Like, you know, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I end the book with these um, state ordinances, basically, that um, County charters, sorry, county charters, small charters that then go on to basically allow the chain gang up through the 80s. And then, you know, you see it reemerge actually in the 90s. But as a primary instrument of punishment, it is not. The chain gang was the primary instrument of punishment till 43. After that, it's like, it doesn't actually go away, but it's, you're, you're usually sent to prison. Right, if you are convicted of a crime, so that's um, that's sort of the ending in '43, and I actually don't I don't look past that. I actually don't look past 1938 um, in terms of the end of this history. I think um, you know there are arguments about Doug Blackman makes arguments about the ending of sort of carceral labor and peonage around a Cold War civil rights moment, right? So that um, 
during the Cold War, there is a, a increased scrutiny around um, civil rights, around Jim Crow, and that's one of the arguments that he makes around why some of these systems uh, sort of peter out, but um, I don't look in the mid-century. Yeah. I didn't look into that period um, either. I actually stopped a little earlier than mm -hmm. the 30s. I include a little bit from the 30s, but my work really ends um, around the progressive era, around no later than 1920, so. Well, at 6.30, we have time to oh. one more question. All right. <laughs> uh, I heard about this question, but uh, in the last uh, one hour, we talk about dehumanization. So one final dehumanization you can do to a people is to deny him or her a decent burial and to deny his or her family the like the certain weight of that person. So my question is, were, were those incarcerated women ever denied a decent burial or how were their remains disposed after their death? Because I think you just talk about their new their newborn children were just uh, disposed in the river. So I'd like to know, okay, how in this Chang'an system, mm -hmm. who will care about their burial and how what will happen to their remains? Mm -hmm. Or finally, or in another way, whether their families may have a claim to those remains or search for mm -hmm. their grave sites. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That is an excellent question. Um, there is actually a cemetery at the, uh, it's the Baldwin, I think it's like the Baldwin County Cemetery or something mm -hmm. like that. That's where um, a lot of the women who are incarcerated at the Georgia State Prison Farm are buried. Um, but in terms of people who died in convict lease camps or who died in these sort of mobile flying railroad camps and in these other spaces, um, you know, my belief is that there may be people you know, who were just literally perhaps buried by the side of the road. I've seen men, examples of men who died in convict lease camps being eaten by the dogs mm -hmm. um, as an example of, you know, terror, leaving somebody to rot in a wheelbarrow and be eaten by the dogs over the period of a week to terrorize, you know, um, inmates. So I imagine that, you know, some of that sort of uh, post-mortem violence was visited on incarcerated women as well. Um, don't have evidence of that, but I can imagine that there are plenty of women who um, just sort of disappeared and their families, because a lot of them were technically socially dead anyway. They were dislocated mm -hmm. from their families, from the counties of their birth, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. And you know, in the early phases of the system, they're not able to write letters and do all of this stuff. So. Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure about what happens to them, but I would imagine that there are plenty of people who um, had very you know, dishonorable burials or were just decomposed. I think one of the things to keep in mind is that, especially during the convict leasing system, there was very little state oversight, yep. right? So it's not like there was a state policy about what to right. do when someone died right. inside a convict lease camp. These right. railroad operators yep. and brick making operators um, could decide pretty much at will. Right. But one of the things that was recently un uncovered is that in Atlanta, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Atlanta, but they're the big sort of arts complex is called the Chastain Arts Complex. And part of that used to be um, a brick making camp where black women would make bricks um, who were imprisoned. And they recently uncovered um, unmarked graves underneath the Chastain County golf course. Um, and what they did when they discovered those unmarked graves underneath the golf course is that they put orange flags at each unmarked grave and then sort of people continue to play. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think we were actually talking mm -hmm. earlier about commemoration yeah. and sort of reparation and what, mm -hmm. thinking about making some plans around that. I, I think we're getting to the end of, uh, of this uh, panel. But I want to return to my question, okay, about the Alabama-Georgia uh -huh. um, connection. Um, 
because I, I think a lot about Alabama because I've at one time had a long-term project working on Alabama. But it seems to me very, very interesting that Alabama would gender its prison mm -hmm. practices. So the black women are working mm -hmm. in domestic mm -hmm. capacities for the most part. Mm -hmm. But in Georgia, they are not gendering. Mm -hmm. Black women are working in coal mines, lumber camps. You heard all of the different places that they work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we talk about then was Georgia a more liberal state because they really erased gender and made it more equitable, something that women would later, you know, you know what I mean? So, so I'm asking, on the other hand, is Alabama sort of, how do you liberal? Yeah. Concerned, what, you mean like neoliberal, I mean, like in a bad way, right? You see, this is really, you know, it, it, there's a question there, you know, about what, and then Georgia then reforms its system, right? Begin to reform it, right? To, to work yeah. more, more gendered kinds of roles at some point. Well, they do put women in sex segregated camps. That's the extent of the reform. Yeah. But they're still doing so men's work so dressed, on the chain gang dressed in dresses. That Georgia and Alabama converged at some point? Well, I just think to answer that, maybe to clarify, I think the thing about Georgia is that black women had a double burden of right. labor in Georgia. That's so right. they had to wake up at 4 a.m. and cook the food and then go right. to the railroad. So it was like, there's no way that there's any interpretation. It's like it's more work than anything that you can imagine. Right. And in fact, in some ways, it's more work than... Uh, it's different work, for sure, than being um, imprisoned as a man in Georgia. But there was also, as Salitha mentioned, they were integrated, right? So they were doing like this reproductive work mm -hmm. that made possible all of the other work, which I think That's people right. underestimate when they say, oh, but some of the work was domestic work. But that is actually the work of reproducing oh imprisoned men so that they can go do other work. Mm -hmm. But then they also had to go to the brick ovens and the coal L mines. And work as lumberjacks and, right. and all kinds of stuff. And laying railroads. So, you know, whatever we want to call I don't know what to call that. <laughs> and that I think that's a Mary Ellen Curtin question, uh -huh. perhaps. You know, Mary Ellen Curtin, I think she would be a great, because um, we rely on her work yeah. to understand the Alabama yeah. um, case, but we, but you know, I've even done work on looking at like women who worked um, as incarcerated garment workers in Alabama, mm. and all of the work it seems is very gendered in Alabama. But even in Georgia, women that worked at the mines oftentimes didn't have to go into the mines. I think the only example of a woman going into the mines that I thought was there, Audrey, but mm. I can't think of really. You know, yeah, but they, know. but anyway, so. yeah, I can't answer that question, okay, I guess. Thank you. <laughs> Let's thank our panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to Kevin for coming to help us uh, coordinate this panel. Thank you. Thank you.